So we'll start on time, and people will drift in. Um, I'm the lead of the British Academy Department for International Development Anti-Corruption Evidence Program. And this panel is an opportunity to showcase some of the research that's come out of that program. And I just want to start off by contextualizing what the BA DFID ACE program is designed to do, what it's about, why it exists, so that you've got a sense of why these presentations are coming in the way that they are. Um, so I'm sure you all know that the Department for International Development in the UK is the main funder of uh, UK development efforts through official development assistance. Um, the, U the UK is one of only two countries in the European Union that actually meets the commitment signed at the UN or agreed at the UN to have 0.7% uh, of uh, gross national income target expenditure on official development assistance. Um, that was ratified again by the European Union in 2005 with a commitment to all EU member states reaching that target by 2015. And as things stand, as I say, only the UK and Germany actually meet that target. But it does mean that uh, UK's ODA expenditure in 2016, which is the, the latest year that we have full figures for, was 13.3 billion pounds. I'm very conscious whenever anybody says billion or million or trillion, they're just, it's just a word. And you know, it doesn't really have a, 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 a meaning for people. So to give you a context of how 13.3 billion compares to say 13.3 million or even 13.3, um, just out of interest, how long do you think it would take if you could count one number per second, how long would it take to count to a million, do you reckon? Any guesses? Well, I'll tell you, the answer is about 11 days, okay? So if it's about 11 days to count to a million, what do you reckon to take to count to a billion, assuming you could count one number every second without stopping, resting, eating, or doing anything else? Any guesses? Hmm? 1,100 days. Yeah. Yeah, it's about 130 odd years it would take. And that gives you a sense of the scale of difference when we say a million, then a billion. So 13.3 billion pounds, although it's 0.7 of percent of the UK's growth gross national income is an absolutely huge sum of money. And of that money, uh, 79, well, 80% 80, 80 of it, more or less, is spent by DFID. Africa is by far the largest recipient. Uh, about 60% of the spend goes on Africa. And, of course, one of the main concerns about official development assistance and overseas aid expenditure that's been raised many, many times is that a lot of it is lost to corruption. Um, now, in the case of DFID, about six, five years ago, uh, these kinds of concerns about the amount of money lost to corruption started to really gain traction. And in particular, the Independent Commission for Aid Impact published two reports, one, one in 2012, one in 2014, which looked specifically at the issue of the loss of aid funding to corruption and essentially came to the conclusion that DFID didn't have any well-established policies or procedures for ensuring that the money that it spent was protected or properly protected from the risk of corruption. 
the second of these two reports was a shocking piece of work, but nonetheless, the, the impact was quite significant. And DFID was charged with ensuring that, given its responsibility for such large sums of money, it had to do better in terms of understanding the corruption risks of spending that kind of money and how to ameliorate those. And it's partly, I mean, in fact, it's largely for that reason. One of the responses to these reports was the establishment of the Anti-Corruption Evidence Program. Uh, the Anti-Corruption Evidence Program has two dimensions to it. One is the uh, British Academy DFID uh, Research Partnership, um, which is the piece or the, the element of the program that, that I lead and that is represented here on this panel. In addition, there is a, a second part to the program which is headed by Professor Mushtaq Khan at the School of Oriental and African Studies in London. And that's a, a consortium focused on particularly issues of feasibility and political settlements analysis in three countries. Uh, with a particular focus on corruption in the private sector. But the BA DFID element that, that we're talking about this afternoon offers broad-based competitive grants with a particular focus on trying to enhance the development of more effective policies and interventions to reduce corruption in developing countries. There are two phases to it. The first phase has run from 2015 and is just coming to an end in 2018. And that was a 3.6 million pound investment on eight projects. And then phase two is a further 5.5 million pound investment, which will sponsor a series of additional projects, which will be let within the next few weeks. So the four main themes to the phase one projects uh, Procurement issues, civil service reform, the institutional architecture of states and informal governance. And the jurisdictions uh, covered in the program are differed tier one countries where corruption is a constraint, but where there's sufficient stability and political potential to try to learn lessons from interventions. So the countries of specific interest for DFID in this program are Ghana, Uganda, Tanzania, Mozambique, Nigeria, and Bangladesh. But in practice, in letting the projects, in selecting the eight projects that were funded under phase one, we covered 31 different countries, 14 of them in DFID areas, plus a series of additional countries in the post-communist Asian Latin American, Caribbean parts of the world. So the key features of what we're trying to do with the projects in this program are, first of all, to get away from uh, simplistic reductionist understandings of what corruption is, to disaggregate the concept more effectively, to focus in particular on trying to identify what works in practice in combating corruption, Setting appropriate benchmarks for measuring success so that we know how we can come to the conclusion that anything does work. Working very closely with practitioners. Having an explicitly comparative dimension in order to be able to learn lessons and paying appropriate attention to political context. And all of these reflect what's in the title of this session, which is anti-corruption and development assistance at a crossroads. I think there's a, a broad feeling amongst many working in the field of corruption and anti-corruption, whether it's international agencies, World Bank, IMF, OECD, whether it's academic researchers, whether it's practitioners on the ground, that after at least 25 years of concerted efforts trying to address the problem of corruption, the end result has been, to put it mildly, disappointing. And we therefore need to understand better why that is. And so, so this program is 
driven very much by a desire to do precisely that. And in order to do that, I think we need to challenge some of the core assumptions that have underlain approaches to both understanding and analyzing corruption over the last couple of decades. So that's the context, and we have three presentations, and then we're going to have a discussion of those presentations. We're going to start with a presentation from a project with the title Curbing Corruption in Development Aid-Funded Procurement. Um, and that's going to be presented by Lily Mark from the Central European University. Then we have a, a presentation on project decentralization, multi-level governance and corruption to be presented by Hamish Nixon. The third presentation is actually just a little bit of a cheat. It's not formally part of the uh, BA DFID eight projects that were funded under um, the program. This was a project funded under the Global Challenges Research Fund, but it's so closely linked to our concerns that it's, it's kind of included with them, and that's a project on islands of integrity, understanding the politics of corruption reduction, and Heather Marquette is going to present on that. And then, finally, Christian Futol from DFAT is going to summarize his, his thoughts about the various presentations and more as he see fit, sees fit. So we've got 15 minutes for each presentation and after that we will open it up and have a discussion. So Lily, please. Good afternoon for everyone. I am uh, Lili Mark from the Central European University. I am a PhD student in economics. And uh, first of all, I am really honored to be here and present here and be a representative of our project team, uh, which consists of Elizabeth David Barrett, Oli Hellman, and Kiara McCorley from the University of Sussex, and uh, Mihai Fazekas from the Government Transparency Institute where I also used to work at the time of this project. So regarding corruption and AIDS, there are inconc inconclusive findings in the, in the literature. Some find that aid fuels corruption. There are findings that, uh, about that aid uh, helps to curb corruption, but there are also studies that find no relationship. So there is uh, definitely some scope for further research and, and, uh, and further explaining this relationship. There is a, a really large share of uh, aid funds that are spent su through procurement. So this is a really, procurement is a really, really important part of uh, aid uh, development aid. So we are going to focus on that in this uh, project as you will see. And we, what we also do in this uh, project is that we try to answer some questions regarding uh, incentives of uh, recipient countries and country context and, and how these uh, incentives and country context interact with, with uh, development aid spending and corruption and what uh, can we expect from these uh, aid spending and corruption issues in relation to these uh, contexts. Questions. So in the first part of our research project, a really huge uh, amount of time was spent on collecting a novel database of uh, procurement contracts uh, that are funded by the development funds from three major donor organizations, the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, and EuropeAid. So our main uh, criteria for choosing these donors was that a really large share of their spending is uh, spent through local procurement systems. So, and uh, there is available data on the contract level about how these uh, contracts turned out to be, 
So we, we, can, we are able to, to build up a database that contains of contract level data and we can, fo we can uh, measure corruption risks uh, in a more granular level than many of the previous studies that use country level indicators uh, often. So our main research questions were, how are corruption patterns affected uh, by changes in donor rules? So this is really important, as uh, Paul already pointed out, that uh, it's really important that donors have a good strategy to control corruption and uh, be prepared for these kind of situations. Further, we want to answer how do corruption patterns vary according to political context. And we also try to put the two together and see whether donor efforts to control corruption work better in some contexts than in others. In this uh, <coughs> table, you can see a selection of our corruption risk indicators that were created to the World Bank database. So it's really important to stress that what you see here, these are indicators of corruption risk and not corruption itself. So seeing these indicators that, that don't tell us that corruption happened in a specific contract, but once we see these patterns, we can be more suspicious about these contracts because, for example, one of our main uh, indicators is single bidding, which means there was only one bidder for a procurement call. So it, it can happen that there was really just one bidder and there was a really fair and open competition, but, but we can be suspicious that, that something was going on because in order to restrict competition and, and uh, keep it to only to our crony, we have to, re to, to somehow rule out the other players and essentially the outcome that we will see is that there was only one bidder. So I want to uh, introduce you to in detail the other uh, indicators because in the working paper that I will show you, we use single bidding, but there are other indicators as well that can be used for monitoring or other purposes. So now I'm going to turn to, uh, to introduce a World Bank regulatory change that occurred in 2003, and uh, we analyzed the impacts of this uh, regulatory change. So there were basically three uh, main types of changes in introduced in 2003. Donor oversight was increased uh, with the introduction of procurement plans, which means that recipient countries and uh, announcing bodies of, uh, of uh, procurement calls have to give a list of planned procurement contracts to the World Bank and, uh, before they start on a project. There was also in, uh, a wider use of electronic advertisement was, uh, was uh, introduced and also e-procurement was introduced, which means that uh, bidders can apply on electronic uh, platforms, which, which made the cost of applying for a, a procurement call easier or, <coughs> or less. So all of these uh, changes point to the same direction that corrupt the, the, the cost of corruption became a bit higher because you have to go through more checks before getting to the contracts and also the access for potential bidders was increased. So what we expect from these changes is that we see lower levels of corruption risk after the, these changes. So this, uh, I, was, I was mentioning uh, country context. So how do we define con context in our, in our analysis? So we focus on two dimensions that are very much correlated with how uh, states and uh, recipient countries' um, uh, motivations uh, vary in different countries. So one of these dimensions is political party system. Uh, in, so one of these dimensions is the time horizon of elites that we capture by po political party system institutionalization, which is a, an indicator that tries to capture how, how many local party branches are there, how organized 
political parties in a country, and we think that this is a good uh, proxy for uh, elite time horizon. So if there is a more organized political uh, scheme, there is a longer time to, to plan ahead for, for political parties. The other dimension is state capacity, which, uh, which is a composite indicator that uh, captures many dimensions of state capacity. So it's from raising uh, revenues to, to maintaining order and uh, <coughs> providing public goods. And here are our main hypotheses based on these uh, <coughs> contextual factors. So the first of them is that these changes in in the procurement rules decrease corruption risk. I already talked about it. We have some hypotheses about how these different contextual dimensions uh, are in relation with the corruption risk. So we believe that higher time horizon or longer time horizon is associated with lower corruption risks because uh, when elites have a longer time horizon, they are more interested in economic growth and they are more interested in controlling corruption, so we expect to see less corruption. We also expect to see lower level, levels of corruption risk when state capacity is higher because state capacity is also means that states are better able to control corruption. And we also have some ideas about the interaction effect. So we, we believe that, uh, so we hypothesize that the World Bank regulatory changes decrease corruption risk most where time horizon is higher. We, this is a really hard thing to decide, so the empirical results will be really uh, educative in this case, but uh, basically a, a change in the, the rules change how elites uh, evaluate the future future gains and, and there is a chance that these uh, changes make short run gains less, uh, less, um, I don't know, less, uh, I don't know. <laughs> so, so, so make, make uh, elites concentrate on long term gains more and control themselves in the, in the short run. And our fifth hypothesis is that uh, World Bank procurement uh, rule changes decreases corruption risks uh, least where state capacity is high, simply because we, believe, we, we think that uh, in countries where state capacity is higher, okay, um, the gap between the, the rules imposed by World Bank and the, and the rules uh, that are already applied in the country is lower, so there is a lower scope for achieving, um, achieving uh, goals. So this is to show you how our methodology works. So this uh, regulatory change was introduced in November 1, 2003, and every project that was approved after this date had to follow the new rules, and every project that started before this date had to follow the older uh, procurement rules. But one project, takes uh, several years, and there are several contracts in these projects that we observe. So essentially after, two, after the, this regulatory change, there are contracts that, ha that uh, have to follow the old rules, and there are also contracts that have to follow the new rules. So at the same time of time, we can see both types of contracts and make a comparison between them. So this is our first, uh, the first set of our results. So I don't know how you much uh, you are familiar with the re regression analysis and, and matching, but even if you are not, you shouldn't be worried. Just look at the numbers in the green box. So these are our findings about how the single bidding share after the introduction of these uh, new rules uh, decreased compared to those projects that ran under, under the old rules. So it uh, shows us that in, under the new uh, regulation, there was a four percentage points uh, fewer single bidding uh, <coughs> contracts, which, which shows that there was some decrease in the uh, 
in the, in the corruption risk. And uh, this table shows the interaction effect. So these first uh, two numbers show that when elite time horizon and state capacity is higher, we see, we indeed see lower levels of corruption. And uh, the other two numbers are the interaction effect with, with these contextual dimensions and the changes in regulation. And so, the fourth hypothesis of ours was not uh, met in the data. We actually didn't find any significant relationship with this dimension, but the, but the state capacity uh, hypothesis seems to work. So it shows us that when state capacity is higher, there was a lower decrease in single bidding as a result of this uh, change in regulations. And uh, this last, uh, result is depicted here on this graph. So on the horizontal axis, you can see state capacity. On the vertical axis, you can see a single, predicted single bid ratio. And uh, the upper line is the, the projects under, the contra contracts under the old rules, and the, the, the line below is the, the, the contracts under the new rules. And we see that the uh, single bidding ratio decreased after regulation, and we also see that it decreased more for lower levels of state capacity. So let me conclude. So in this project, we built a NOAA database of procurement level, uh, procure, procure contract level procurement data, including some corruption indicators. So we use this database to analyze uh, a World Bank reform and we found that this reform works and context matters how this reform has an impact in different countries. And I, I would like to also add that uh, this is just an illustration how we, you can potentially use this kind of database. This is just one application, but you can repeat it in other countries, in other settings, in other time periods. So that's the most uh, thankful part of this project. And I would like to also add that although this uh, phase of our project ended in December, but uh, my colleagues are involved in, uh, in, the, in another round of uh, DFID funding and uh, they're gonna work on uh, ex extending this database with national level procurement data and get a more uh, complex picture of how these uh, regulation changes impact in different countries. So thank you for your attention. Hamish? I'm bringing my phone out as a timer because the last time I spoke on one of Paul's groups, he made us do a Pecha Kucha. I don't know if you know what a Pecha Kucha is, but it's a slideshow which advances 20 slides every tw one slide every 20 seconds, no matter what you do. Uh, in other words, it's a small version of hell. <laughs> and I haven't completely timed this, so I'm gonna start my clock. Um, thanks uh, for the opportunity to present the research and, and to Paul and Heather and others to pulling together the panel. Um, I wanna start by acknowledging that this has been a joint project with uh, two country partners, Center for Policy Dialogue in Bangladesh and the Center for Democracy and Development in Nigeria. Uh, I've also got co-investigators in Alina Rocha Menokal, and uh, some inputs from Paul Smoke at New York University as well. Um, with the short time slot, I just want to take a few moments to outline the rationale for the research, um, and then discuss a little bit the theory around this question of decentralization and corruption, because um, it's important to understand that this, the theory doesn't address this issue very well. Um, and then present some synthetic level findings, but maybe illustrate them with a couple of examples um, from the actual work that we did. So what we did is a, a comparative study across Bangladesh and Nigeria on local level governance and corruption. It wasn't really a study of decentralization in the sense of a dynamic reform, but rather a sense of the decentralized local governance institutions that exist in both places. And the study basically was motivated by the fact that the theoretical and the empirical literature uh, are inconsistent on the impact of decentralization on corruption. Some of the models argue that 
Decentralization should reduce corruption. It creates more accountable and transparent local governance. Um, there are other arguments say that the increased autonomy allows for local capture or the proliferation of actors increases uh, corruption. Empirical studies that try to link these two things also are ambiguous on the effects of decentralization and corruption. So a starting point was a critical review of both of these literatures and what that review concluded was that this inconsistency in part is because of the underspecification of decentralization that's used and the underspecification of how we think about corruption. So a lot of the comparative studies just look at fiscal measures of decentralization but don't talk about devolution versus deconcentration or the autonomy of local governments, the functioning of intergovernmental relationships, local accountability, or the coherence between the different dimensions of decentralization, fiscal, administrative, and political. And often, as you know, these studies are based on, on measures of corruption that come from cross-country indexes, so it might be perceptions of corruption, ease of doing business, et cetera, but fairly broad brush um, indicators. So we wanted to look more closely into these relationships, and um, we did it by by pursuing largely but not entirely qualitative research focused on re three research questions. The first was around what are the differences and similarities in the prevalence types and dynamics of corruption in these different decentralized environments and what are some of the factors that might help account for them. Are there different impacts or effects of these kinds of corruption at local level and could that relate to issues of inequality, gender, exclusion? Etc. And thirdly, what are the implications of these findings for tackling corruption in different decentralization, de decentralized settings? And the research did focus on particularly looking at anti-corruption initiatives that had local salience in those, in those places. So a few broad brush theoretical and then empirical synthetic findings, um, which might be a starting point for discussion. I mean, the first is that Something to understand is that there are different theoretical lenses on decentralization, and as Heather and her colleagues have written, there are different theoretical lenses on corruption as well. And the effects of, corrupt, of decentralization on corruption that you expect to see depend on the theoretical lens that you bring to it. So this is pretty obvious, but what we tried to do is sort of document and provide a bit of a framework for bringing these together. So in decentralization, there are three broad lenses for looking at the process of decentralization. The first approach, which is the oldest, derives from public economics and public choice theories, and it frames decentralization essentially as a way of improving public sector performance, defined within the context, basically, of principal agent relationships. And so it implies that principal agent analysis is the best way to understand when you change those relationships, what's likely to happen in terms of corruption. And it maps really nicely on the kind of clit guardian approach to corruption, which focuses on issues like discretion, um, uh, accountability, et cetera, but which are very incentive-based. The second approach um, to uh, decentralization focuses a lot more on political economy and the interests and motivations of those driving decentralization processes as well as those affected by them. So it highlights political and institutional context of reforms, and it also focuses a lot on the diversity of decentralization. So there's a lot more discussion about devolution versus deconcentration and whether this is, creates different um, incentives. A third kind of approach, and this is less kind of consolidated in the literature, but we, I, I think it's there and it's certainly one of our co-investigators, Paul Smoke, is, is a big part of this approach, F emphasizes the process of decentralization reforms and the large implementation challenge that they present, just like other public sector reforms. So changes to central local relations in, empower new actors, create new interest groups, and engender different kinds of resistance. And the best way to understand the performance of a decentralized system is not through its formal arrangements, but depending on a complex system linked to the organizational, institutional, behavioral changes that need to take place but have different paces and sequences. Um, and in this way, decentralization, like other development problems, shares 
uh, features of collective action problems. So these second two lenses also map somewhat onto the evolution of theoretical perspectives on corruption, um, which focus increasingly on political economy and then on collective action and then on a kind of third generation of social norms or social theory-based understandings of corruption. So these two sets of lenses kind of interact. And in a nutshell, what you find is all the theoretical literature that tries to bring these two topics together basically focuses on the first two lenses, the lenses which are largely incentive-based in their analysis. So that's an important framing for what we then find at the local level, because if our theory doesn't apply and the tools that derive from that theory don't apply at local levels, then that's, we think, an important finding. Um, the second is that the performance then of the given multi-level governance system in controlling corruption is less related to the formal features of its decentralization than its real-world implementation. So the theoretical gap I've just mentioned is reinforced by the, the research. The formal arrangements in both Nigeria and Bangladesh are very different from each other. Nigeria is a three-tier federal devolved arrangement, and uh, Bangladesh has quite devolved very local government, but is largely a deconcentrated system. Uh, but in neither of these countries do the system, do those institutions function effectively because of contradictions in the laws, in the regulations, and in the actual implementation of them. And that is far more important in driving the patterns of corruption we see, we, we, we propose, than whether or not it's a deconcentrated system or a federal system or devolved system. Um, how am I doing on time here? We've got about six minutes. So in Nigeria, for example, I mean, a couple of quick examples, um, you have constitutionally mandated local level government. It's supposed to have a, a guaranteed share of the resources. It's supposed to have elected um, local councils, et cetera, um, and uh, devolved government. Uh, in, but in practice, these, pra the, these powers aren't really there. The mandated funds for local government are actually paid into state joint accounts, so are completely at the mercy of state governments as to whether they're passed on to the local level. The ability to create a local government, which is a, a state power, is actually contradicted by the need for that local government to be affirmed by the National Assembly, which means states create local development associations, essentially, rather than governments, and local governments are left somewhat orphaned. Um, local elections have been incompletely implemented, and actually this gave us a nice, I wouldn't say a natural experiment is too formal a term, but a comparison between states where there had been local elections and states where there had not, and, a, and a, certainly in a qualitative sense, there was no difference found uh, between these. It was simply that the vertical industrial organization of corruption to get the envelope from the state government with the money for the local government was organized based on an elect electoral system where there are elections and based on other forms of vertical bottom-up payments where there weren't elections, but the experience of the corruption was, was not different. In Bangladesh, you've got local councils at, um, elected local councils at local level, but they have uh, very little ability to hold local bureaucrats accountable. So service delivery is managed by local bureaucrats who are only accountable to their central ministries. Um, and so even though the creation of a devolved local council exists there, it doesn't affect service delivery. On the other hand, the bulk of the development budget is largely influenced by the elected politicians. The bureaucrats have very little say over it. And so those two sort of mutual accountability relationships between a political accountability and an administrative set of accountabilities at the local level don't function. And in fact, uh, this interaction of political and, and uh, citizen accountability is shown up in, in a really sad phenomenon, um, but one that's familiar probably to many, is, is that actually local organs of citizen accountability are captured by uh, the political electoral competition. So school-based management committees are essentially tools for organizing block voting. Um, at all levels of government in Bangladesh, beneficiary selection for social safety nets is organized in order to run block voting. Uh, and even the distribution of school books, for example, is in some ways 
organized around the same kinds of drivers. Um, there's a lot of evidence from our work, but also a lot of other documented evidence on the, the really important uh, anti-poor impacts of these types of corruption there. Anyway, these findings and others lend support to kind of look at using systems-based and collective action-based approaches to understanding and fighting corruption. I don't think I need to go into that into too much detail, but similar to the multi-level approach to looking at, at decentralized governance, it's the functioning of the relationships between the level that are more important than what the particular levels look like. Um, the results also kind of support theoretical positions that strong enabling conditions for accountability like media, rule of law, and citizen participation are important, but only when they correspond with functioning supply side institutions, ones in which political, administrative, and fiscal dimensions align with each other. I think a third kind of finding is that the evidence supports as you go down, social understandings of corruption and the concept of normalization of corruption become more and more important. This shouldn't become, come as a huge surprise, but it's, it, it's important to document. So th there's an increasing acceptance of bribery as a part of normal life, the more local it is, um, as well as nepotism and other forms of slightly more silent corruption like ghost workers and absenteeism which actually was pointed to in Bangladesh as one of the, the, the biggest issues, but one that might not be on the top of everyone's list of corruption scandals. Um, and so finally, these, these findings probably help explain what we observed in terms of the very poor local perception of most anti-corruption initiatives in the two cases. And these anti-corruption initiatives all, all really fall into two broad camps. One are the agency-based type approaches, which have been written about elsewhere. Um, and the other are awareness-raising type approaches. In both countries, there's strong and widespread perception that these, the kinds of local corruption create a gulf between reality and the, these institutional or public awareness-based approaches to fighting corruption. So they do exist. There are citizen groups engaged in corruption issues in Bangladesh. Less so in Nigeria at the local level, but there are. But this isn't really perceived to lower corruption, and there's an important link this to, to some work that Karen Pfeiffer's presented at this conference, I think, yesterday. Um, hmm? um, and um, the reach of the anti-corruption agencies is seen to be really only relevant to conforming to international standards. So Nigeria has made great gains actually in getting off various lists um, through its imposition of anti-corruption commissions, the Economic, Fine, Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, et cetera. And these, these bodies do have offices at state level, but they're seen as very under-resourced. And what was most talked about by the respondents, particularly in the public sector, is actually much simpler. The lack of implementation of already existing systemic means to combat corruption no local audit, no monitoring of mandated fiscal transfers, um, and the failure to implement really simple tools like civil service codes of conduct, the failure, to, um, um, the weak implementation of citizens' charters and things like this. So one implication of the study, if we have to sort of boil it down, is that localized corruption is really important. It has some distinct features and it's best understood and fought through an understanding of a range of implementation-related governance challenges rather than big picture changes to one or, or another form of decentralized governance. Thanks very much. Thank you. Right, thank you very much. I'm here to present um, research that I'm working on with Karen Pfeiffer, who um, sadly has two pieces of research presented here, and uh, she's not here to do either one of them. Uh, and uh, Dr. Razida Armitage, who is an ANU uh, alumna as well. Um, as Paul said, this is funded through the Global Challenges Research Fund, which is a, a large 
research fund in the UK that comes out of the ODA budget, but it's not managed by DFID, it's managed through the research councils. Um, however, because we had so much in common and it gives us a great opportunity to bounce ideas and learn from, from the ACE community, we've been included in, in meetings and so on, which is a, a, a real joy. Um, the work I'm gonna be presenting today is work in progress. We're coming to the end of the project, but we're right in the writing up stage, so please treat these as preliminary findings today. Um, coming up, we're going to have a methodology paper, which is soon to be published, two country case studies, and a comparative paper as well, and these will all be available uh, as open access downloads on the Developmental Leadership Program website. So the project looks at a, uses a positive outlier approach to understand how corruption is controlled. Um, most anti-corruption research, you may have noticed, is very good at explaining failure, but there's actually very little out there that tries to explain success. And since we're really interested in low quality governance environments, um, we would probably be looking for unexpected success. And this would be relative to the environment. So this might not be um, situations or sectors where you're going to see an elimination of corruption. They might not be successes, broadly speaking, but relative to all the other sectors within that country, you've seen some sort of positive change. We're also really interested in a potential political story behind the positive outliers. And that will become apparent when I explain the methodology. And finally, it has to be said, after 20 years of studying corruption and corrupt, anti-corruption, when you look at failure most of the time, it is really nice to focus on success for a little while as well. So the project has been joyful for that reason. So Karen developed a methodology for trying to identify positive outliers on bribery back in 2012. And there's a paper on the DLP website that has sort of a first go at the, at the methods. This project with the British Academy was designed as a pilot to test this out in the field um, and to see if we can say something beyond the methodology as well. So um, we are very pleased to say the method works, but we're also very pleased to say we can tell you more than that as well. A lot of positive outlier uh, case studies uh, in the wider literature often tend to rely on reputation for sampling. So you would speak to experts who would say, you really need to look at the education sector in this, in this country because there's been a change of leadership and something really positive seems to have happened. What Karen's statistical model does is it throws out unexpected successes. So things that maybe nobody is looking at or realizes are going on because that reputation isn't there yet. And that's actually a really exciting contribution from the research. Um, and the paper that will be published soon talks a little bit about how that might be used well beyond the corruption and bribery. So these unexpected case studies that are below the radar can hopefully teach us some unexpected things as well. With the first phase, um, Karen ran the, the data from the global corruption barometer looking at bribery, cleaned it all up, and what we what we were left with at the end of that were 24 possible cases that were identified in the stats. And I have to say that wasn't just cleaning the data. We knew we were gonna go to field work, so we also eliminated potentially really exciting case studies in environments that were too dangerous to do the field work in. Um, so hopefully, perhaps in a, in a further phase, that might be something um, that could, uh, could be looked at. The research then importantly has a second phase. Um, and you know, the cartoon here about, you know, a type one error, false positive, false negative. What we wanted to do was to figure out before we went into the field if these were actually, you know, the, the uh, outliers that had come up might be false negatives or false positives. So from that process, we were able to, to narrow it down to uh, five cases that we looked at in depth. And we went through a lot of uh, conversations with experts, phone calls, emails, looked at um, comparing the GCB data to lots of other data, including local data like you know, Afrobarometer or, or LAPOP. Um, and by that, we were able to narrow down to the two case studies we had budget for field work to do in this. Um, things, just to give you an example of why that phase is absolutely essential, two that came up we were quite excited. One was the education sector in Sierra Leone. 
and one was the land sector in Mongolia. And after extensive digging around um, in Mongolia, we think that the most likely explanation for why there was a reduction in bribery is because there was an economic uh, decrease and so land transactions would have gone down because uh, there, was, uh, there were problems with the economy. That's not a very interesting story to tell. And with Sierra Leone, sadly, the data corresponded with the Ebola crisis. So no children in school, no bribes paid. Um, and with the Ebola crisis thankfully over, bribery rates have shot back up as well. So again, interesting, but not a, not a good case study. What we were left with were two case studies, one probably more than a little surprising here. Um, and these were the cases that we actually went to the field with and did five to six weeks worth of field work uh, in both. And with the field work, we were able to find plausible explanations of a political story behind the cases. And they're both very different stories as well. But the first is the Uganda healthcare sector. And we have here in this time period, you would have predicted based on all the other sectors that you would have seen an increase of just over 11% in the bribery rate over that time. And you actually saw a big drop of to minus five. So bribes went down significantly and they went down even more significantly relative to expectations. In the South Africa police, there have, been a, there have been a lot of reforms. You would have expected to see a decrease, but you actually saw a, a very significant decrease relative to everything else as well. In Uganda, I'm gonna give you just a very brief intro to the, the explanation. In Uganda, what we found was that in 2009, so right when the, the data started showing, there was a health monitoring unit that was set up by the president's office that had an exceptional degree of support and direction from the president and from the minister of health. The, uh, the health monitoring unit was set up specifically to strengthen the accountability infrastructure in the sector and to reduce things like bribery and theft in particular. So a very, very clear policy and strategy to tackle bribery in the sector. And we have clear evidence that it is the HMU that explains the, the bribery reduction. South Africa is a little bit more complicated because we went into the field with a particular hypothesis around a key reformer who'd come in, found out that she was an incredibly controversial figure, she was un <coughs> said to be underqualified for the job, was a political appointee. Um, we started panicking, thinking we don't have a second case study, what are we gonna do? And then we discovered um, by comparing a lot of data and talking to experts in uh, South Africa, police corruption experts, that most of the change, the positive change that was recorded was in a specific district. It was a district, uh, Limpopo district, that had gone through massive problems with fraud and, and public financial management problems and so on, to the point where the national government um, basically took the district over. At the same time as that, so you have a complete overhaul of the bureaucracy and, and greater accountability to the center, you also had a national level target of the area for police corruption around smuggling. And South Africa has a specialized national police force. Um, it was the Scorpions, now called the Hawks. And they sent the Hawks into this rural district they have special cars, they look quite scary, they don't have the local connections into local law enforcement and so on. And so because of that, even though this wasn't a specific anti-bribery initiative, because you, know, you had all these national level monitors there for public financial management and you had the hawks stopping local police looking for smuggling, you also saw things like bribery go down as well. So it's a good example of how you can have an indirect anti-corruption approach that's actually effective at uh, reducing corruption. Yeah, I am not the stats person, so I'll say that the predicted ones were based on what you saw in terms of bribery levels in other sectors in the, in the country. So yeah. So what you would expect given the low governance environment. So those would be what you would expect. And the actual shows that there's something specific in the sector that's better than you would expect given the rest of the. So looking at the average, you would expect the, the uh, predicted number to be 11.2. So an increase in bribes by 11%. And you saw actually a decrease. Okay. 
the periods there, 2009, 2013. Well, okay. They're both first and 2009, so they're four they're years. They're not compared. They're not can, compared I, can I ask that we, we save questions yeah. of, of, of yeah. this kind till afterwards and let the presentation finish first? They're not designed to be comparative periods, and there's reasons for the, the numbers that are to do with the, the statistical available. Yeah. So bearing in mind that these are preliminary analysis looking at the, the uh, two cases, we've picked out three explanations that we think um, can explain what's, what's happened in terms of those reductions. Leadership, disruption, and fear come up again and again. So in terms of leadership, um, the top woman up there is Dr. Diana Atinwe. She's the Minister, the Ministry of Health's Permanent Secretary. And you have Acting Head Hawks, uh, Lieutenant General Lisa Matakata um, in South Africa. Um, both cases clearly point to the role of strong committed leadership and differing degrees uh, political leadership and support. So whether that's you know, high level presidential or local level as well. The South Africa uh, case, we're also starting to explore sector characteristics because with the police, you get command and control. And so that comes up a lot, the fact that you know, within the police, raw and eggs theory is really important because if you get um, bad police leadership because of that, um, you're, you're going to have more problems than you might do in other sectors. With disruption, we started thinking about corruption like a spider web where there are lots of, of uh, really delicate interconnections and you can disrupt those quite easily um, in a sense. In Uganda, the uh, top is the Minister for Health and while they were in the field, one of the things that she did through this unit was she dressed up in a burqa, went to a local uh, health clinic whipped off the burqa when she was asked for a bribe, and there were camera crews, social media campaigns, and so on, which you can see over there as well. And there were lots of tactics like that that the HMU did, and it made, um, it made health workers very scared, which is why fear comes up. So they stopped asking for bribes or accepting bribes. In South Africa, you had the introduction of uh, vehicle tracking, which gives hard evidence that backs up citizens' complaints. It also gives investigators a chance to see where people are going and what they're doing as well. And in rural areas, the hawks are very visible as well. So they disrupted the patterns of what police were able to do. <coughs> However, don't get too excited yet. Um, because these are definitely not unqualified successes here. We do have genuine concerns about sustainability. So like with a spider web, spiders can repair that disruption pretty quickly, and you would need to have this as a, as a long-term strategy, because if disruption works, and there's evidence in the literature that says it does, you need to keep going back and disrupting and finding new strategies to do that. It's very unclear that anti-corruption is actually the right end game. And uh, that is really clear in Uganda, where the unintended consequences of that policy are only just starting to be felt. Um, with the healthcare workers, they are so badly paid that for many of them, without those bribes, they've become destitute, particularly in the rural areas. And they're so demoralized that they're leaving the profession, some of them going into prostitution or potentially crime as well. Um, so the unintended consequences may actually be worse in the longer term than the corruption itself. What this means is that these are not unqualified successes, but they're not failures as well. And so where we're at right now is we're trying to think through how do you talk about qu qualified success and failure. And we came across this paper by Alan McConnell, which looks at uh, gray areas in between and says that success and failure in policy, you have to look at politics, process, and programming, and you can have a spectrum of success and failure across all three. So the, the Uganda case may eventually be a political success at the time, <coughs> probably not as it goes on, but programming-wise, it's a failure as well. And so as our ongoing analysis, we'll start to unpack this and to think about what this might mean for how we think about anti-corruption programs as well. My two final slides here. It's also confirmed some of the earlier research Karen and I did around the need to think about anti-corruption in terms of functions. So greed and need are not necessarily the, you know, they're, they're a simplistic way of looking at it, but 
what we would argue the Uganda case shows is that you know, there's plenty of evidence to say raising low salaries is not going to eliminate corruption, but what we're arguing is that if you're going to successfully tackle anti-corruption, understanding that that's why this is happening, so that you build that into your program and your policy, would help to eliminate some of those unintended consequences. And finally, thinking of unintended consequences, something that really hit us for six when we went into the field is this, perhaps naively, we thought it might be easier to start talking about success rather than failure. And actually, people were angry that we were trying to study success in low governance environments because they said, what if the political leadership used your research as an excuse to say, look, we're doing something about corruption, so you need to take pressure off of us. In South Africa right now, that is an extremely difficult thing, and we found a lot of antagonism in the field at the idea that we would study success. Um, and that's left us with this question about what is our potential impact as researchers on the political context, and should we be thinking about the unintended consequences of studying success in really volatile political environments? If you have suggestions for how to do that without the, the unintended consequences, we'd appreciate that. Okay. Thank you very much. Christian, are you going to sit here? Uh, no, I'll go up. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Christian Futol, and I'm from the Law and Justice area within the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be the last speaker in the last session of the day, so please bear with me. Uh, so today I'm going to cover three things um, during my talk. I'm going to provide some general reflections on the importance and implications of anti-corruption research. I'm going to provide some uh, reflections on the three anti-corruption uh, research projects that we've just heard our speakers talk about. Uh, and finally, I'm going to talk about what DFAT uh, and other policymakers' uh, research needs are within the anti-corruption space. So in terms of general reflections, the first point I want to make, and it reiterates some of the comments from the other speakers today, is just on the importance of actually having research that explores policies and interventions that have had some sort of impact in helping to reduce corruption and its negative impacts. As I'm sure everyone in the room knows, there is a wealth of literature out there that examines the effectiveness of a variety of different anti-corruption interventions, uh, but as speakers have noted, it mostly typic or typically focuses on why an intervention failed, or it examines why there was insufficient evidence uh, to make an assessment as to whether an intervention had any sort of impact. There is much less analysis on what works and why, and how do we best attempt to even address particular problems given particular contexts? And these are the questions that most pra practitioners actually grapple with day to day. The second general point I want to make relates to political economy. And the abstract for this session sort of noted that to have any real impact, uh, we need to be sensitive to local context, as well as understand not only what is technically sound, but also what is politically feasible. I would argue that for research to have the best chance at actually impacting and influencing uh, development, implementing, and policy agencies, uh, we also do need to have uh, or, or be sensitive and understand the political economy that occurs within development, implementing, and policy agencies. Uh, as we all know, every institution and even different parts of the same institution have their own incentives that will impact the way in which they utilize research findings or use research or incorporate that into their own policies and approaches. So if I could turn now to um, the first of the research projects that were discussed today, the Curbing Corruption in Development, aid-funded procurement. Um, given Paul's opening remarks about the sort of uh, disappointing results of anti-corruption interventions so far, the first thought that came to my mind uh, in relation to the finding that the 2003 World Bank reforms were effective was, of course, one of relief and reassurance. You know, changes to donor rules can actually work. I think, as I said, in an environment where we really do need to know more about what works and actually have examples of what works, um, you know, this research does support other procurement studies that have found that increasing oversight uh, and increasing accountability, and Lily talked about the specific ways in which, you know, the World Bank uh, undertook this, 
as well as reducing opportunities for corrupt acts, um, can, in the right circumstances, reduce corruption risks in procurement. So I think that that's a good start. Um, Lily also talked about you know, some of the corruption indicators, and I think the use of proxy indicators, as they basically were, uh, to identify red flags or potential corruption risks in procurement uh, is quite notable. Um, and that's because it, uh, it's, uh, sorry, it supports practitioners uh, with one of our biggest challenges, which is how do we measure different types of corruption? Um, there is the potential with you know, greater dissemination and training on the use of proxy indicators combined with uh, greater understanding and access of procurement data more broadly. Um, it would possibly enable the, the use of a broader range of stakeholders, government and non-government actors, to actually better analyze and understand potential corruption risks in procurement, and hopefully then to devise responses accordingly. The study also found that political context, which in this case was party system institutionalization and state capacity, uh, and it found that it can affect uh, patterns of corruption in procurement. Um, and again, I think this just reinforces the very important point that context matters and political economy matters. Um, at a very broad level, you know, better understanding how the political context in recipient countries affects the potential for corruption risks in aid spending is useful for several reasons. Um, it helps us to avoid the use of one-size-fits-all approaches, which are never helpful. Uh, it can inform donors who are looking to strengthen and refine their own guidelines and rules relating to how we spend and, uh, how we spend and direct money through national procurement systems. Uh, it can inform thinking about what possible control mechanisms and anti-corruption interventions to actually employ. And I think it can also enable relevant actors to better manage as well as possibly engage with risk. And of course, it can help strengthen our approaches in terms of monitoring and evaluation of procurement systems and our engagement in procurement systems. Um, if I could turn now to Hamish's presentation, which is about decentralization, multi-level governance, and corruption. I think it's pretty clear that there's a lot more that development practitioners can learn about decentralization and corruption, uh, including the impact that corruption can have in different decentralized contexts, as well as the impact that decentralization can have on different types of corruption at the local, subnational, and national levels. I think as Hamish noted, the evidence on the effectiveness of decentralization as a strategy for combating corruption um, is inconsistent and often inconclusive. Uh, as he noted, some studies have found that decentralization can be successful where there's local capacity and high levels of participation in community monitoring. Alternatively, decentralization may be expensive and ineffective when implemented in communities that lack particip participation and capacity. And studies have also shown that decentralization can either lead to increased oversight by local citizens or increased capture by local elite, elites, depending on context. So Hamish's study, and what I took away from it, was again, um, the fact that it highlighted the importance of context and political economy. And as Hamish noted, you know, the, the performance of decentralized governance systems are much more related to real world implementation than formal structures. Um, I know Hamish didn't actually talk about this in his presentation, but he was um, uh, good enough to give me a brief summary of some of his notes. And, and one of the other things that um, this study kind of suggested was that uh, diversity and intensity, I think this was in Bangladesh, of corruption can possibly be reduced with greater localization. Um, and to me, this finding combined with his point about um, implementation needing to be, or implementation being key, key particularly at local levels, um, makes me think, all right, if that's the case, do we know why this is the case? Is there applicability in similar contexts? And if so, what can we do? What should we do? And how do we go about it? Um, the issue of decentralization, and particularly working at you know, local levels and grassroots roots levels, is probably something that development agencies don't typically have as much direct uh, experience in. So I think this is, this is an area in which we, continue to learn, we can continue to learn more on. A couple of other quick points, I think, um, based on Hamish's presentation is that um, in terms of our approaches to decentralizing governance and mechanisms that we use, is there anything we can, how can we better take into account particular contexts such as the ones that he talked about, where perhaps different types of corruption or different concepts of corruption have been normalized? And I think you also mentioned Grant's research on anti-corruption messaging, and that's where we can interlink um, what we're finding about, out about different types of research and use that to inform our thinking. Another point or question that I, that I want to think about is, of course, how can we better connect the pieces 
um, between our national level and our local level anti-corruption efforts. Um, and again, these are things that relates to enforcement, accountability, even public awareness. Um, turning to the third research project, which is on islands of integrity, um, again, as I've already said on multiple occasions, we really do need to know and have more examples of what works and why, um, and how, exa how exactly did such reforms overcome the contextual hurdles that they may have encountered. And so I think this research is of particular interest to um, a number of uh, practitioners and to, and to myself included. And so Heather's already talked about you know, some of the specific issues that were encountered, not only across sort of the health sector and the justice sector, but in relation to broader issues relating to you know, disruption, fear, leadership. And those are the sorts of uh, issues and considerations that we can think about as uh, policymakers and implementers, because they can possibly have application across a broader range of scenarios. I think in analysing the politics of success and how successful changes occur, one of the things that I would find particularly useful is perhaps knowing a bit more about what the role of donors, sorry, what the role of donors and external actors actually was in supporting these changes. Um, was it as a catalyst, as a convener, as a supporter, or was it a mix of different roles? Um, as we all know, all donors aren't created equal. Um, and for example, the, the reach and obviously the resources of DFAT, DFAT is much different to DFAT. Um, and so I think it's incumbent for us to also better understand and better reflect on what is firstly within our own sphere of influence, what is realistically possible for us to affect and, and support. And then the next question is how can we better engage and support those efforts based on our own, based on our own expertise and capacities. Um, two other quick points about Heather's presentation that I'd like to touch on, again relates to this issue of what is success and how do we identify what success looks like um, again, if you look at the literature, a lot of anti-corruption reforms are often assessed as being ineffective. Um, and this is partly due to the fact that their objectives of the intervention were either poorly designed or just too ambitious at the outset, or the intervention was just not well implemented. So I think a question is, you know, how do we account for unrealistic design or bad implementation of otherwise good reforms? Do we need to reevaluate how we uh, define and measure success? Um, and I think the, the points Heather talked about in terms of programmatic success and political success uh, are quite pertinent. Um, the second point I'd also make is in relation to unintended consequences of research. Um, and Heather raised a really good point that you know, research can be you know, used for, for nefarious purposes. Um, but the point I want to make, I suppose, is, um, in, again, goes back to this point of the importance of having research identifying what has worked and what can work. And um, the reason why I want to highlight that is because although it is very important to understand why something may not have worked and how we can learn from it, we also don't want to discourage actors from even attempting anti-corruption reforms or supporting positive reforms and change. I think that in today's times, oftentimes in a zero-sum game, if anti-corruption reforms or indeed broader governance reforms is seen as just too hard, then there's always the danger that efforts and resourcing are directed elsewhere. Um, instead of perhaps that small contextual reform that could help ensure that the service is delivered more equitably or indeed could be a precondition or could combine with other efforts to affect broader, uh, broader positive change. So to talk about the last thing I have to talk about, which is what are some of DFAT's anti-corruption research needs, um, I think very quickly, DFAT, like any other institution, is made up of different areas. Um, which have different operational and policy mandates, so our anti-corruption research needs vary. Our research needs can vary depending on whether or not research is being driven by headquarters or centrally versus country level, whether or not we're seeking to inform a medium to longer term policy document or strategy, whether or not we're looking to inform our um, discussions and uh, positions at an international level, or indeed whether or not we're seeking to inform an on-the-ground intervention. So because of these various factors at the most basic and broadest level, I think that research needs to be fit for purpose and fit for the audience. Since I'm sure none of that is surprising, I will finish on four points which I think, um, I think research can help to better address the most common challenges that uh, policy agencies and development practitioners uh, encounter. Uh, so the first is basically where research does, you know, analyze and uh, look into why a particular intervention or reform didn't work, I think what would be more useful as well, if it's not already evident, is to include consideration on how the identified shortcomings or the reasons for failure 
could have actually been overcome in the context that was discussed. Um, I think second, research is always more readily actionable uh, where it's sensitive to the political economy and often the constraints of the implementers. And as we know, constraints can mean uh, the extent to which an external party can actually engage within or across sectors or institutions in another country. Uh, we all know donor investments are typically bound by financial and time limits. Um, there may be competing interests within, or within organizations. And I think we also have to be mindful of what's actually required to implement uh, investments and interventions in terms of staff capacity and expertise. Uh, the third area where I think, um, sorry, the second area, third. Um, the third area where I think um, obviously research can help is always uh, in terms of monitoring and evaluation. Um, as sort of discussed by some of the panelists already and touched upon, there are difficulties in measuring corruption, in measuring levels and changes in corruption, as well as me measuring whether or not interventions have been effective. Um, so I think this is something that we continue to need to work on. There's difficulties with data, attribution, and even if you can figure all of that out, cost becomes prohibitive often. Um, so that's the third area. And the final area that I'll talk about, and this comes back to sort of a central theme that I've been trying to weave in my comments, which is on the importance of actually understanding what works and also explaining instances um, of what works. And I think the question becomes, how can we better understand and measure the effectiveness of multiple complementary reforms. Um, and by this, I often think of an example in Vanuatu, where in 2015, as some of you may know, uh, 14 MPs were convicted of bribery and corruption um, and jailed. And to my understanding, this was the first time, <coughs> excuse me, uh, this was the first time that MPs were actually convicted of this charge um, and their convictions and jail sentences were actually upheld despite numerous attempts, uh, both judicially and polit politically, to undermine that. So to me, this is quite a significant outcome and quite a good, anti good example of an anti-corruption outcome. <coughs> Excuse me. Might just grab some water. Um, of a good anti-corruption outcome. If you look at how this impact probably was achieved, it was probably the result of numerous different efforts, though. You know, it probably was the work of Vanuatu justice officials, as well as support from partners across a range of areas from court administration, uh, trial advocacy, judicial training, uh, evidence gathering, and even witness protection. And so if you were to analyze any of these individual, individual reforms in terms of their effectiveness, um, would your assessment change if you assess them individually versus <coughs> cumulatively? Sorry. Um, yeah, so on that point, I'll end. Thanks. Great. We've got um, just a few minutes for any questions that anybody has, but we don't seem to have anybody with the, the mics, um, so I'm going to have to do it myself. Um, so if you have any questions, please let me know. Okay, one here. We'll take three or four, and then come back. <coughs> yeah, that one's on. Hi, I'm Christine Van Hoof from the University of Cambridge. Uh, a question for uh, Hamish, if I may. Um, I was wondering if you could comment briefly on whether you found that in the two countries um, that you studied, whether um, political competition amongst elected officials affected how decentralization was implemented um, and whether that, um, how that affected anti-corruption um, achievements of decentralization. Thank you. I think there was a question at the back, right at the very back. Right at the very back there. Sorry, I thought one was. <laughs> um, my name's Tamus Wells from uh, the Policy Lab at the University of Melbourne, and thanks for a fantastic panel. I thought all of the speakers were, had some really interesting points. Um, I, I had a question for Heather, but it also cuts across the others as well. And I was wondering about the, the it feels like there's two things going on. One is um, telling compelling individual case study stories, but then there's also a desire to aggregate and bring it together to have lessons that we can kind of carry around to other contexts. Um, but at the same time, when we do that, it feels like they get thinner as we go. So we end up with headlines like leadership matters for corruption. 
Um, so I guess that's a question, yeah, about how you handle that tension of aggregation versus letting individual stories speak for themselves. Jacob, thanks. Yeah. Um, Aaron Sowens from RMA team. Um, so a quick question to Lily. Um, did you have a way of linking your corruption risk indicators with actual corruption? Or was that more of a hypothesis? Um, and to Hamish, um, how do you incorporate the role of culture <coughs> into your model of uh, the link between um, decentralization and corruption? So for example, in, in India, I know a lot of corruption tends to map onto more traditional patron-client relationships where the politician is a patron and is, ex and is expected to give gifts to uh, the people under his patronage or her patronage. Um, and um, culturally, that's, that, is see that is seen as something that's ex expected. And so uh, how do you incorporate that? Take a couple more. So one here, one here. Um, just a quick remark about um, the experience in Vanuatu. There's actually a really good article um, with Miranda Forsyth, um, who uh, works, I believe, at the Pacific Affairs, and James Batley. And it was just really interesting how they, uh, you know, went through the play-by-play, the blow-by-blow play -play, blow of the whole process, and involving like, you know, um, expatriate judges and, and so on and so forth. And it's just really interesting. I think it was in the Journal of Pacific History. So it's just a good read. It's a cracker. So. <laughs> Uh, my question was again on the topic of decentralization and uh, corruption. I'm Tulika Narayan from Apt Associates, development economist. Um, and this is not really my topic, but I was, as I was hearing you describe the relationship between the two, and as you were describing the decentralization of the two countries, it almost appeared to me that there was corruption in the process of decentralization itself. So it wasn't clear whether decentralization even occurred. And so if that's the case, then how, how can we draw the relationship between this decentralization and corruption? Is that, is that true? Did I understand that correctly? And, and if so, then are there more successful stories of decentralization either historically among developed countries through which we can tease out the real impact of decentralization on, on corruption? Okay, thank you. Shall, shall we have a go at those? And then if this time we'll take some more. So, Lily, do you want to go first? Can you hear? Can you hear me now? I don't know if it works or okay. Probably yes. So, so these uh, indicators don't. Uh, so, so using these indicators, we are not able to to see whether corruption happened, and and we in this project we didn't uh, go and check real corruption cases. But what we did for validating these indicators is we checked the, the relationship with well-known perception-based indicators of corruption, which are, of course, country level. But we, what we always do is we check uh, country-level country correlation of our indicators and, and um, standard perception-based indicators. And we, we would like to. So, we all, all only deal with indicators that show a reasonable correlation between these. So that's our main uh, measure to, to validate somehow these indicators. And of course, it, would, it, it, it is always very nice to have special cases when we can show that they, these really work in, in concrete examples. So Yes, that, yeah, that's what, that is what we can do. English? Hi, uh, thanks. Uh, I think two or three good questions in there. I mean, I think this research for me was an experience of uh, a little bit of few because some of, as in relief in that what we found validated some of my own ingrained biases about decentralization, which is there's no such thing as decentralization. There is only particular real world manifestations of implemented decentralization, and that is always driven by political drivers and political conditions, not by textbooks. And making that transition 
from understanding decentralization as a process in a textbook sense, which those first couple of lenses tend to focus on, to a real world sense is, I think, really important. And, I've, and it was a relief to see that the data validates that view of the world. It also created some uncomfortable feelings for me in that it um, uh, challenged some aspects of my view of the world. One big one is that electoral politics seems to be a really problematic phenomenon in both of these countries, and that uh, large elements of the uh, process of decentralization, as you say, are organized around harnessing electoral politics for different purposes. I think essentially capture of rents in, in Nigeria and party political, more, more national level party political drivers probably in Bangladesh, but you know, quite um, serious concerns and one could be led to the conclusion that local elections are a bad thing. Um, so one of the challenges that I have is to find a way around that conclusion or at least to temper that conclusion with with this impression that it's about how different elements of the system work together. Um, but I think kind of a little bit, both of these questions actually from the two of you next to each other is that, you know, the, the motivation for decentralization has a range of dimensions and how to capture rents is one of those dimensions probably inevitably and, and that is what takes it off track. That's why it doesn't get um, implemented in the textbook fashion. Um, I think what's really interesting about this is that in these two countries, the, the, dis the normal distinction that we hear about between petty or bureaucratic corruption and political corruption seems meaningless. Petty corruption is just the local form of political corruption, certainly in some of the services we looked at, particularly in Bangladesh. I wanna make that <coughs> statement a universal one. But, but certainly it's a, it's a very powerful one that, you know, the two countries we saw had, had pretty powerful vertical industrial organization of corruption that might look like petty corruption at local levels but is actually part of a multi-level kind of system. Just quickly on culture, I mean, we, we worked hard with the teams to come up with a conceptual framework which focused on three constructs. One was the nature of decentralized govern governance, so what, what are the features of the system, the uh, f types and forms of corruption that are observed, and the kinds of anti-corruption measures we wanted to focus on to kind of create some comparability. As you can see, culture was not one of those constructs, so we didn't explicitly use that as a lens to enter into the, the work. Coming out of the work, I think, is strong results around perceptions of the, normali the normalization of corruption, which I think relates to the kinds of cultural reasons you, you speak to. I'd like to look a little more closely at it maybe again in light of your question, but it's not an explicit focus. I think, I think what we s definitely see coming out more than cultural explanations would be these power political, vertical industrial organization of the political machine kind of, kind of um, explanations. Um, this is in by yourself. History does come up though. I mean, the, 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 the historical trajectory of why you're federal in Nigeria, why you have this type of local government system in South Asia in general is obviously fa a factor. Hamish, hey, just a follow-up question on, on the Bangladesh story. When I was doing research on local government in the mid-2000s in Bangladesh, the Union Parishad uh, chair was about the most accountable public figure in the entire system. Um, and the, the, but then you had a much more pluralistic national political <coughs> scene. And in the last decade, you've, you've seen a more a, a movement to a one party state. So in the, in the old days, you basically had rural elites infiltrating the administrative machinery, sometimes changing parties in order to get central government rents, um, but they were really locally <coughs> accountable. So could you just, do you have any comments on, you know, what you've, what you've observed, you know, in 2016, 17, um, in light of that kind of historical context? I mean, it builds on Christian's observation. So <coughs> it does appear that, so we looked at Upazila's 
municipalities and unions, so that's a basically declining level of scale. And the union parish had the most local, had the lowest diversity of forms of corruption that they were look, people were reporting on, and and a kind of <coughs> some sense of accountability. So that was hence the comment that, you know, maybe it's not all bad uh, news about about localization, but okay. not not unfortunately not very systematic data, I have to confess. Heather. If I can just respond to one of Christian's comments first, which is um, what was the role of external actors in these cases. Um, the statistical analysis in phase one is what selected the case study. So it wasn't because um, the funding comes from UK aid and so BIFID had interesting case studies to look at. It's literally the stats. And in both cases, they were national level reform um, that actually didn't involve external actors at all. So it's not to say that you know UK government, USAID, and so on invest a lot in the Uganda health system, but they didn't fund this. This wasn't an aid project. Um, so that was quite exciting, actually, to, to look at local reform initiatives. But we do have a process of engagement with different policy and practitioner audiences over the next couple of months to really try to tease out what does this then mean for external actors and for anti-corruption design as well. I have to say another thing that was really great about this method that Karen developed, about which kicks out these unexpected positive outliers, is that nobody we consulted with had heard about them. So you know, South Africa has a huge, rich and diverse uh, corruption, uh, you know, academic corruption uh, research community, including tons of people who specialize in police corruption, and none of them were aware of this reduction over this time period. So it's you know feeling quite fraudulent as people who don't specialize in South Africa when you rock up to talk to experts. Um, it's really exciting that we're going to be able to make a contribution in that, in that way. Um, this point about telling interesting case studies but also wanting to aggregate. Um, our publication strategy will hopefully help us speak to both. If you want to tell those deep contextual stories of political change within a country, you need to do that largely qual through qualitative research and country case studies. If you want to say something more broadly about what lessons there might be that you can look across different cases, then you have to do that comparatively. Um, we did design the team in a way to try to do both. Um, so Karen is a stats person, I'm a corruption policy expert, and uh, Rosita is an anthropologist. So we might not always agree on every single aspect of the research and what to highlight or so on, but actually those debates are really important in, in terms of what we hope uh, allows us to do both. Um, certainly, this is a pilot, so if it's going to go into a next phase, we would definitely spend more time in country, um, and uh, I think we'll try to do more, you know, try to look at cases from the beginning in a comparative way. So if you're able to do more cases, you can try to make sure that you're, you're doing comparative, uh, you know, aggregate studies in that way. Okay, thank you. Christian, same question, thoughts? Um, Thank you very much, Christian. Well, I'm, I'm sure there are many, many further questions that people would like to raise, but I'm equally conscious that I'm holding you back and you're late for a reception. Uh, so I'm sure people also would like to get away. So can I just thank all of the speakers on, on the panel and can I thank you as the audience for the session?